Hey everybody. Hi. We're back again. We're going to continue our series on the Gospel of Luke. Up until now we've been talking about preparing for the coming of the Messiah, that is for the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem. And today we are going to talk about the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem. So I think this is going to be very exciting for you. Please join us, hang in there until the end. You're, there's a lot of things that you're not going to want to miss. Okay, so just a little bit of review before we get started. If you remember last time, we talked about Mary returning, showing to Nazareth. This created, of course, a problem with Joseph, but because he heard from God himself, he was able to accept the baby. He also received the notification from God that this baby was to be called Jesus, Yeshua. Because of that, he then was encouraged to take his wife, that is to take her in the second stage of marriage, and that's exactly what he did right away. And we talked about that, the hoopah, and uh, the different ceremonies that are part of that both then and today. Well, then we got back to John the Baptist, the circumcision of John. This is when his father and his mother both told everybody his name is going to be John, which was not a family name for them. And so uh, when they did that, Zechariah was miraculously able to speak again. So that was a very exciting moment. And he began to prophesy, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he gave all kinds of very detailed prophecies, or really just quoting from the Bible, but what he was quoting were prophecies that related both to his son and to the one that his son would go before, which is, of course, the Messiah, Messiah Jesus, as we know him today. Well, today we're gonna to get into some new territory. And <laughs> that means we're gonna just focus a little bit more on the, what's going on among the Romans who were ruling over Israel at that time. And to do that, we're going to start out in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Karen, would you read that for us? Now it happened in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to enroll in a census all the inhabited earth. Okay, good. And what's our question? Who was Caesar Augustus? Yeah, who was Caesar Augustus? Well, he was the one who was the emperor, or the ruler of the Roman Empire at that time. And to help us get to know him a little bit better, we have this slide which shows us his adopted father, Julius Caesar, who was the first one to rule really as a dictator, or you could say an emperor, although he was not officially an emperor, but uh, he was the first one to rule by himself over the entire Roman Empire in the way that we would later know as the rule of the emperors. So later in his life, he adopted a young man who took the name Caesar Augustus, and Augustus is just an honorary name that was given to him. Uh, the reason he had the name Caesar is because even though Caesar was a family name for Julius Caesar, it then went on to become basically a word that meant emperor. And so every emperor after that was known as the Caesar. But these first two are very, very important because even today we remember them every year. Uh, in the months of July and August. July is named for Julius Caesar, and August is named for Augustus Caesar, Caesar Augustus. So even in our calendar, we remember them. So that's how important they were to Western civilization, Western society. Okay, well, let's continue on now with Luke chapter 2, verse 2. Karen, you want to read? This was the census before Quirinius was governor of Syria. Okay, and our question? Where is Syria? And? Who was Quirinius? Right, so who is this guy? Uh, this is a verse that creates problems sometimes. People argue over whether it says the first census or the census before. There are several different ways to read it. But Quirinius is a person that we know from history. You can see some examples here of inscriptions that have been found with his name on them. Syria, if you look at the map on the right-hand side, is just north of Israel. So if you look down in the yellow area with a Roman numeral one on it, that would be basically the area where the Jewish people were living, Judea and Samaria, and a little bit more. And then up above that, the big yellow area, that's Syria. So Syria was a big, important province in the Roman Empire. 
And we know that Quirinius was the governor there from 6 to 12 AD, but that was a little bit after the time that we're talking about when we're talking about Jesus' birth. A couple of unknowns about this verse, but basically it lets us know what we need to know. Okay, let's continue. And everyone was going to register, each to his own city. Okay, good. And our question? What does it mean, each to his own city? Mm -hmm. And follow up? How was it Roman census done? Right, well, that's the key right there. Uh, in certain areas in the Roman Empire, when they took a, a census, then you would have to go back to your ancestral home, the home that you are originally from or your family is from. And we know about this because of some papyri that record a Roman census in Egypt, which is right next to Israel, or at that time right next to Judea, and that's how they did it in Egypt. So we have historical evidence that they did take the censuses, at least in the eastern part of the empire, in the same way uh, that the Bible tells us. Okay, and we got the blue arrow, so let's go ahead and look at the follow-up question. Would the Jewish people consider a Roman census to be a good thing? What do you think? Would people be happy about that? Uh, I think no. No, I don't think so at all, because censuses were usually for, uh, you know, recording the names of people so that you'd know how much to charge them for taxes, and people were not happy about paying taxes. Now, we're not entirely sure if this registration, which took place at the time of the birth of Jesus, was a taxation census. It might have been a different kind of census. There are a couple of different ones that were done by the Romans. So uh, whether it was a taxation census or not, we're not sure. But we do know that later there was another census which was related to taxation, and this made people very upset. So Karen, you want to read the verse here coming out of the book of Acts, a cross-reference verse. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. Okay, so this is talking about when Jesus was about 10 years old, and they did take a census, this time for taxation, and people got really upset, and uh, thousands of people died in the fighting. Okay, well, let's continue now with Luke chapter 2, verse 4. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house and the family of David. Okay, right. So you see he's going there because that's how they're taking the census, by families. And you have to go to your ancestral home. And so he had to go to Bethlehem. And our question? Where is Bethlehem? Yeah, where exactly is Bethlehem? Well, let's take a look at the map. You see the map there on the right side. Galilee is up in the northern part where it's a little bit greener. And you see there's a yellow circle there. And right in the middle of that is Nazareth. Nazareth sits right on top of that hill there. And from there, they would have come down. Oftentimes, the Jewish people going south would go deep down uh, into the, uh, the valley there where the Jordan River is running. That's that wiggly line that comes out of the Sea of Galilee, which is the, the blue circular shape towards the north. And it goes all the way down to that elongated bluish or purplish shape at the bottom, which is the Dead Sea. So they would have walked along the, uh, the, the side of the Jordan River there as they made their way to the south. And then when they got just north of the Dead Sea, they would cross the Jordan again and go up into the mountains to Jerusalem. And then the road would take you over to Bethlehem. So that's how they would have gone. So Bethlehem, as you can see there, is very close to Jerusalem, you know, only about six miles away. So it's not very far at all. You could basically walk it in an afternoon. When we talk about the birth of Jesus, Christmas is a very beloved holiday amongst Christians, so there's all kinds of traditions that have grown up over the years about it. Uh, but some of those traditions are not really correct, and you'll find that out immediately if you go to visit Israel. One of them is that Bethlehem is not in a valley like you see in many Christmas cards. It's actually up on top of a hill. And the sheep are not the beautiful white color we often picture in our Christmas cards. They're more of a tannish color, and if you look at the faces, and oftentimes the legs are a darker brown color. So a little bit different than what we imagine for Christmas time. So this is what Bethlehem looks like today. Now you can see that arrow up at the top. It's pointing down to the very top of the hill. And that area up at the top of the hill there, that's where the village of Bethlehem was 
in Jesus' day, also in David's day. It didn't grow out and down the slopes as you see it doing today. And in fact, the city's even quite a bit larger than what we can see in this picture. But at that time, it was only that area up at the top of that hill that we're looking at right there, which the arrow is pointing to. So let's continue with verse 5. To register himself along with Mary, the one betrothed to him who was pregnant. Okay, good. And what's our question? Why is Mary still called betrothed even after he has taken her as his wife? Right. As we saw, he, he already took her into his house. In other words, he's living with her now. Uh, how come she's still called betrothed? Any idea? Well, it has to do with the fact that, if you remember in a verse that we read earlier, he was not being intimate with her yet and would not until the baby was born. So according to Jewish law, and according to the law of many other cultures as well, the actual marriage begins when the couple begins to sleep together, have sex together. And he did not do that. He waited until she gave birth to the baby. And so from a technical point of view, they were still betrothed, even though they were actually living together now. So that's why she can be called betrothed. All right, let's continue. Now it happened while they were there that the days were fulfilled for her to give birth. And the question? What does it mean that the days were fulfilled? This is a review question. Do you remember what we talked about that before? Yes, it's the uh, time filling up rather than time running out. Right, they looked at time as something that would fill up like a water clock, whereas we look at time running out uh, like in a, you know, the launch of a spaceship or like in an hourglass. So they had a completely different view of time than we do today. Okay, let's continue. Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no place for them in the guest room. Okay, where I come from, we call that a trough, feeding trough. Uh, but you said guest room. Aren't most people used to hearing the word in here? Well, actually, the Greek word, which appears here in the original document, the original sources, is katalima. And katalima is actually not the word for an inn. So we have to say no to that, even though it's become traditional. Uh, but if you talk to uh, Greek scholars, they know quite well today, because of discoveries that have been made in recent years, that the katalima uh, was not an inn. There is another word that appears in the Gospels for an inn. In Greek, it's pandokeion. But the problem we have with putting a pandokeion, an inn, into the story is that at the time, an inn would have been a caravansary, a place for the caravans to stay the night. And this is a big open court, lock, courtyard like you can see there in the picture in the upper right-hand corner. A lot of arches around the outside. And in the center, there would be uh, some kind of a well or spring where the animals could be watered. And also there would be a lot of hay strewn all over that courtyard so that the camels and the donkeys could get something to eat while their owners were sleeping there for the night. But it wasn't a very private place. It was very public. They didn't even have doors on the little rooms around the outside of the courtyard back in those days. I don't think Mary would want to give birth here, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just not, it's not private enough. And uh, of course, you wouldn't, certainly wouldn't want to give birth in a public place. I'm sure every mother would agree with that. So then, what, what does this word katalima mean? Well, we have an answer to that question. It appears right in the Gospels. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, if we jump ahead to Luke 22, verse 11, where it says, where is the guest room, katalima, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? That is the actual meaning of guest room, a place where your guests could stay in your home. So Karen, we've got a question here. What's the question? So where would a guest room be located? Right, well, the homes that they had back in those days were these multi-family homes. Uh, the archeologists call them insula, which is a word like island. And that's because there was a little courtyard in the center, had a bunch of rooms around the outside, and there was an exterior wall which cut this off from the other houses nearby. It's, it's isolated, it's an island. And so that's why they give it this name, insula. And uh, within each one of these uh, homes, 
there would be one special room set aside for guests, and that would be the guest room. But one problem with that, whose guest room would they want to stay in, right? Because when they went to town, where would they stay? Obviously, they would want to stay with their relatives. That's why they had to go there, because they were from there. They had relatives in that town. So, of course, if they're going back to that town, they would have wanted to stay with their relatives. There probably wasn't even uh, an inn or uh, a caravansary in Bethlehem at the time. It was too small. It wasn't on any major trade route. So uh, they would have naturally gone to the home of their relatives. And this is where they would have decided to stay. But, as the verse tells us, there was no place for them in the guest room. Why? Because all the other relatives had to come there for the census too. So they were... <laughs> They were stuck. They couldn't stay in the guest room. Well, here's another follow-up question. Where did they go instead? Well, it's there in that same verse that we just read, a little clue. And what's the question, Karen? Where would you find a feeding trough? Yeah, it says they laid him in a feeding trough. Feeding trough, right? Why would he, where would you be to lay a baby in a feeding trough? in a barn yeah someplace where there's animals that need to eat well back in those days underneath their homes they cut out man-made rock cut caves that they used for stables or for storing grain or for different other things the temperature would stay cooler down there so it would store different kinds of food items uh, longer than if you had it up in the hot house up above and so most of the homes in fact a lot of the old traditional homes in Bethlehem and other uh, older cities in Israel today have these rock-cut basements, some of them which are very ancient. And so this is where they would have gone. They would have gone into the rock-cut stable down underneath the house. Now, that would not have been a problem for Mary, I don't think, because, as I said, she wouldn't want to give birth in a guest room that was filled with people. And if she went down into the rock-cut stable in the basement, she'd have some privacy and she wouldn't have to worry about little kids running in and out and people coming in and out. She would be able to give birth in a nice, quiet place. And no problem, because the lady folk who were upstairs could come up and down the stairs to deliver things to her, to help her, you know, bring hot water, uh, whatever was necessary. Because back in those days, the men were not allowed to participate in the birthing process. They had to go some other place, and the ladies would get together, and they would take care of that by themselves. Okay, well, all of this took place, according to tradition, right in the Church of the Nativity, or rather in what is today the basement of the Church of the Nativity, which used to be the basement of the house where they were staying. And that old Church of the Nativity is the white cross-shaped roof that you see surrounded by the yellow circle. That's a very old church. It's one of the oldest churches in the world, 1,700 years old. And the village uh, here would have been included almost everything you see in this picture and not much more. Right? That's only how big the village was in the time of Jesus. So this Church of the Nativity, uh, that cross-shaped section is the oldest part of the of the church and it goes back you know it's built 300 years after Jesus birth more or less now if we go inside this is what you see those big columns that you see right in the middle of the picture those were part of the earliest church that was built here now it's been rebuilt a couple of times since then but a lot of the elements are original including those columns and if you look on the right side, you can see that's the front of the church. And there's a little platform there at the front, just beyond where you see the man walking. That little platform is built up over that ancient cave basement underneath it, which is where the traditional site where Jesus was born. So there's stairs on either side. If you go there as a tourist, you can go down in and you can see it. And when you get down there, this is what you see. There's a room, and at one end there's this fancy installation with the pointed star supposed to you know be the exact place where Jesus was born of course you know it would have been somewhere near here if this was in fact the right place and even if it wasn't the right place let's say they got the wrong house somehow the wrong the wrong house basement 
uh, the, the village was so small, it would have been very nearby. So if this wasn't it, it would be within a stone's throw from this location. Because the baby was uh, born down in this rock cut basement, uh, later people didn't, uh, you know, especially Gentiles, they didn't understand how these houses were built in Israel very well. So in uh, Eastern Orthodox tradition, they always show the baby and the Mary uh, down in a cave. And that's because it's a, it's later on, uh, the house was destroyed and only the cave was left when the earliest Christians began to go there out of curiosity to see where Jesus was born. And so uh, this kind of became the idea that he was born in a cave. But actually, it was a, a, a rock-cut cave basement under a house, is how it was at the time when these things happened. Okay, we got the blue uh, arrow. That means we're going to go back to this verse again, and we have a follow-up question. What is that, Karen? Why would she put her baby in a feeding trough? Yeah, or, you know, usually it's translated manger, but it actually means a feeding trough. It's a place where you put the, the food for the animals to eat. Well, why do you think she'd put her baby there? Because it's the cleanest place in the barn. That's right. That's what some farmers have told us when we asked them, because we're kind of curious ourselves. Why would you put a baby in a manger that sits the cleaning, cleanest place in the barn? So uh, that would, it's also perfect size. You know, there's just enough room for a baby in there with a little bit of straw on the sides to keep it from banging its head against the rock. But otherwise, just a perfect place to put a baby. Now, these rock-cut mangers are found all over Israel uh, from the time of the New Testament and the Old Testament. They didn't have enough wood to make wooden mangers like you would see in a lot of Christmas cards. You know, Israel's right at the edge of the desert, so wood is rare and valuable, expensive. So instead, they made their feeding troughs out of stone. Now, if we go back to that basement of the church, on the side from the place where Jesus was born, there is this installation, and that's supposed to be built above the actual feeding trough where Jesus was laid. So if you peel aside the marble uh, panels you see here, it's supposed to be an actual stone feeding trough down under there. And so that's, again, the memory of Jesus being laid in the feeding trough. Okay, let's continue verse 8. And there were shepherds in the same region staying outdoors and keeping night watches over their flock. Okay, good. And the question? Why were the shepherds outdoors at night with the sheep? Is this what they always did? What do you think? Do, do uh, shepherds always stay outdoors with their sheep? Except for when it's too cold. Except for when it's too cold. And guess what? It gets cold in the winter time. Now, this picture is a little bit blurry, but you can get the idea very well. It doesn't always snow this much in Israel every year, you know, maybe once every seven or ten years. But it does snow, uh, you know, maybe three out of seven years. It certainly gets cold enough. I remember being pretty cold in Jerusalem, and especially if you live in one of those stone buildings, those stone buildings just hold the cold. It becomes like a refrigerator. So our dormitory there was like that. It was pretty cold in the wintertime. So yeah, it gets cold in the winter, and you're not going to want to be outdoors with the sheep when it's so freezing cold like that. No, the shepherds go out with their sheep after the cold evenings uh, warm up a little bit. So I don't know if you can make sense out of that calendar there at the top. It's set up according to uh, the Jewish calendar. You can see our month names at the very top, and underneath there are the Jewish or Hebrew uh, month names. But you can see that the, the arrows start off where it says May or Sivan. So, you know, once you get to May in the evenings, it's getting a little bit warmer. And certainly by the end of May or certainly by June, it would be possible for these shepherds to go out and stay out with their flocks. In fact, they would want to go out there as quickly as they can because the rain falls in the wintertime and that little bit of grass comes up in the desert and uh, it's first come, first served. Whoever gets there first gets that grass for his sheep. So they will get out there as soon as they can in the springtime and then they will continue to pasture the sheep, sometimes many miles from home, right up until the fall. And then when it starts getting too cold again, 
they'll bring those uh, sheep back in towards their village and they'll, uh, they'll tend them or pasture them in the area right around the village. When it's so cold, they need to go indoors at night. So wait a minute. If they only go out into the fields with the sheep in May and they stop doing it in October or November, why are we celebrating Christmas in December? <laughs> okay, well, that's the question, isn't it? There's another clue that we have in the Bible, and that's the census. Remember, they were going down to Bethlehem for a census, Mary and Joseph. Now, a Roman census would never be taken in the wintertime. It's just too cold for everybody to get around. It's dangerous. And besides, in Israel, the wintertime is actually the sowing time. So if you look at that calendar up there, you see the word sowing. That's in December, January, February. That's when they'll actually sow the seed in the ground. Now, the emperor was never going to interfere with that because he gets a percentage of that crop. So he's not going to put the census during the spring sowing. And he's not going to put it during the fall reaping because, because again, he gets a portion of that crop. So when is he going to have the census? Well, the most likely time would be at the end of the main reaping season. And that would go into August, September, maybe October. And that also matches the last that the shepherds would be out with their sheep in the field. So that gives us a time for Jesus' birth not what we usually think of it, but actually in uh, sometime around September. And it's interesting that there is a Jewish festival right around that time, the Feast of Tabernacles. So is it possible that Jesus was actually born during the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, some people think that John in his gospel is giving us a little hint when he said in John 1.14, if we go right into the Greek, and the word became flesh and tabernacled, among us. Could that be a hint as to when Jesus was born? Well, you know, we can't answer this question for sure, but it's certainly possible. And another interesting thing is, if you count nine months back before that, that brings you to basically Christmas time, or what in the Jewish calendar is the Feast of Hanukkah, which is a celebration of the victory of the Maccabees over the Greeks who were trying to destroy the Jewish religion. And of course, a very important festival, because if they had not succeeded, really, Jesus would not have been able to do his ministry, because the Jewish people would essentially have been wiped out, or at least in terms of their religion, would have been ended. But because of the resistance of the Maccabees, celebrated by the Feast of Hanukkah, there was still a Jewish people with a Jewish religion in the time of Jesus, and so Jesus' ministry could happen. Now, another name for the Feast of Hanukkah is the Feast of Lights, also called the Dedication of the Temple, because they were renewing the temple after it had been polluted by Greek idolatry. Well, wouldn't it be interesting if, like I said, you count nine months back from the Feast of Tabernacles, that means Jesus' conception would have been at the time of the Feast of Hanukkah. And what beautiful imagery is that? Because He's the light of the world coming into the world during the Feast of Lights. Very beautiful idea there. So who knows, maybe. Okay, we got the blue arrow and we're going to have a follow-up question. Karen, what's that follow-up question? Why would they take turns watching over the sheep at night? Yeah, why would they do that? Because nobody wants to stay awake the whole night. They can just take turns. Right, that's exactly it. They have to watch the sheep during the night because, you know, there might be somebody bad there wants to steal them or there might be a fox or wolf or some other animal that wants to kill the sheep so you do have to have somebody awake all night and so they would go out in groups and they would just take turns watching the sheep at night and that's exactly what the language says here in the original language of Luke chapter 2 verse 8 but then what happened verse 9 and the messenger of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were frightened with a great fear they were, we use the word petrified today, really, really scared. Okay, and what's our question? Why were they so afraid? Yeah, why were they afraid? You know, most people think, oh, an angel showed up. So nice, so happy, right? And it's always scary when an angel shows up. Yeah, in the Bible, whenever an angel shows up, it's something that makes people scared. And I think it's not just because of the, what they see with their eyes, it's what they feel, the power of God actually coming into a place. Not just the idea of God but the actual presence of God. That seems to terrify people. 
Okay, next verse. And the messenger said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I'm bringing you good news of a great joy, which will be for all the people. For all the people is what it actually says there. And our question? What people were these? Yeah, what people do you think that's talking about? All the people in the whole world. Well, that's certainly how we think about it today. But the people who heard this originally, when they heard a phrase like the people, they would immediately thought of the Jewish people, right? That he's telling them about a happy news for the Jewish people. And what would that be? Verse 11. For today there was born a Savior for you, who is Messiah the Lord in the city of David. Okay, so what's the message? There's going to be a Savior who is Messiah. And again, remember, most people were thinking of a political Messiah in those days. Some people were thinking of more of a spiritual Messiah, but their biggest concern was getting rid of those Romans. Okay, well, what's our question? What is the city of David and you know, why? What's the city of David? It uh, says here, Bethlehem. At Christmas time, we hear city of David. We certainly think of Bethlehem. But actually, city of David is used in the Bible for two cities. One is Bethlehem, where David was born, also where Jesus was born. But the other one is Jerusalem, which was conquered by King David, and so was called also the city of David. But in this case, of course, we're talking about Bethlehem. Next verse. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a feeding trough. Okay, good. And uh, what's the question? Why would this be a sign? Right, a sign is something that points to something else. So it's, in other words, pointing to something more than what you see. So what would the sign be here? Well, a baby in a manger is unusual. A baby in a manger or a feeding trough is very unusual. Of course, that's certainly true. But... Could there be a deeper meaning here? Well, remember, I told you that those feeding troughs they used at the time were made out of stone. And stone had a particular meaning in the culture at that time. According to the rabbis, that stone would always be ritually clean. There was nothing you could do to make it richly unclean. Now, it might get dirty, but as far as ritual purposes go, it would be ritually clean. Another thing about stone is it's very strong. You know, you have to smash it with something very heavy to even hurt it a little bit. And uh, so, you know, it can endure for millennia, for a long, long time, almost eternal. And certainly makes us think of eternal things when we see big rock mountains and things like that. So in the Bible, stone is actually an image of God. And we can see that in lots of different places. Here's one in Psalm 18. Karen, you want to read that for us? The Lord is my rock and my stronghold and my deliverer, my God, my rock. I seek refuge in him. Yeah, it calls God rock twice in one verse. So this is a very common image that we see in the book of Psalms. Here's another one from the same Psalm. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be God, the rock of my salvation. Right. So what in a country where you see rock mountains around you all the time, it's just very difficult to look at those rock mountains which have been there for generations and millennia and uh, not be reminded of the eternity and the strength and the power of God. And so what does that mean then? If we're talking about God as a rock and the baby is in a rock manger, what is the sign? Do you see, the sign is telling us that this baby is more than an ordinary baby, that this baby is God. That's the sign. That's what it's pointing to. So let's continue. Verse 13. And suddenly there appeared with the messenger a multitude of the army of heaven, praising God and saying... And the question? Does God have an army? Yeah, because I've translated it literally, the army of heaven. So is that right? Does God have an army? Yes. Yeah, it certainly does. In English, sometimes we translate this as, you know, the host of heaven. And today people think of parties when they hear the word host. But it actually means host as in a huge army. And so that's the image that we have constantly throughout the Bible, that God is king over the army of heaven, that he controls what is going on through his army. So a very different image than we often think of when we think of God. So these angels showing up are not just uh, choir members, right? <laughs> this was the army of heaven coming there. I mean, who knows exactly, but probably to make sure nothing went wrong with the birth of God's son. 
Let's continue. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among the people to whom he shows favor. Okay, good. So that's kind of an interesting expression, the people to whom he shows favor. And again, we've translated that very literally from the original language. What's the question? Who are these people to whom God shows favor? Yeah, who's it talking about again? Those who believe. Well, you know, it doesn't say everybody, does it? The people to whom he shows favor. So who are these people to whom he shows favor? Now, the translation that a lot of us are used to is, like you see in the King James Version, goodwill toward men. And that makes it sound like it's something good for everybody in the world. But that's not exactly it. It really says peace to the people of his goodwill. In other words, the people for whom he has favor. So peace among the people to whom he shows favor. Well, who's that people? Well, if you were to ask a Jewish person in those days, they would most likely connect it with the Hebrew phrase, b'nei ritzono, the sons of his favor, which would mean the Jewish people. So again, the Jewish people hearing this story would immediately associate a lot of these phrases with them. But of course, part of the reason Jesus came was to expand who God's people were beyond just the Jewish people to all those who would accept Jesus. And so in that sense, today we can also be part of this people. We are the people of his goodwill, the goodwill that he has shown to us in Jesus. Okay, let's continue. And when the messengers went away from them into heaven, the shepherds were saying to one another, let's go up to Bethlehem now and see this thing that has happened that the Lord made known to us. Okay, good. And our question? Why did they say go up? All right, this is actually a review question. Do you remember? Because Bethlehem is up a hill. Right, it's up on the top of the hill. So the darker arrow in the middle, that's pointing down to where the shepherd's fields are located. And of course, they could also be much further away than that. And the arrow over on the right-hand side, the wider arrow, is pointing up to the top of the hill, which is where the village of Bethlehem was located at that time. So they literally had to go up into town to try to find out what happened. Okay, verse 16. And they went in a hurry and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby laid in the feeding trough. Okay, good. And the question? Why were they in a hurry? Yeah, why did they go in a hurry? I suppose the sky exploded with multitudes of angels and uh, they told you that something had happened that you would be anxious and excited to go find out if you could see what they're talking about. Yeah, I sure think so. I mean, this is not something that happens to you every day. This is something that happens once in a lifetime. So when you got a message like that, you would definitely want to find out what is going on. What is this all about? Okay, the next verse. Now when they saw them, they made known the saying that had been spoken to them about this child. Okay, good. So the question? What was this special saying? Yeah, what exactly had they been told about the baby? Do you remember what they said? That he would be born in Bethlehem. Well, okay, yeah. Anything else? Uh, that uh, he would save the people. He was the Savior. Right. He was the Savior who is the, what? Messiah. Messiah. The Lord. He's going to be the King, the Messiah. The idea of a Messiah is the King of Israel, right? So he's going to save you. And again, most people would not have thought about this spiritually the way we do today, they would have thought he's going to come rescue us from the Romans and from other enemies, and he's going to do that by being the king, the king of Israel, Messiah the Lord, in the city of David. But of course, we know that God himself had an even bigger idea as to what the Messiah was going to do that most people were expecting at that time. Okay, good. So let's go back to where we were in Luke chapter 2, verse 18 now. And all who heard it marveled at the things spoken by the shepherds to them. Yeah, why did they marvel? Why do you think they were marveling? Oh, nobody had heard of a sky full of angels before, or uh, that their scriptures may have been fulfilled. This was... Right, I mean, just imagine these new. people have been looking forward to the birth of this Messiah for hundreds of years. And for somebody to walk in the door and say, hey, it's happening. This baby is that Messiah. That's just incredible. You know, for something that you have longed for and you've wanted for so long to suddenly be coming to pass, that's incredible. And of course, they would have gone, wow, is this, can it be possible? Is it really true? 
they would have been amazed by it. And especially because the people coming to tell them were shepherds, you know. This is not the kind of thing that shepherds would often run around doing and saying. It was quite unusual. All right, next verse, 19. But Mary remembered all these things, pondering them in her heart. Yeah, what does it mean to ponder? That's not a very common word these days. Do you know that word? Uh, to, to think about and consider. And... Yeah, to think about it over and over and over and over again. You kind of think it, it, you keep it in your heart and you think about it for a long period of time. So that's what Mary was doing for years. She was thinking about these things. Maybe for the rest of her life. Well, I'm sure she was. Okay, next verse, 20. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. Okay, so everything happened just the way they were told. So that's amazing all by itself. And what's our question? Where did they go back to? Yeah, where did they go back to? Back to the sheep. Right. Those sheep are out there waiting for them, so they better get back there pretty quick before anything happens, because they might be responsible if any sheep get lost or eaten or something like that. So yeah, they had to quickly go see, and then they had to quickly get back again. So, whoa, what's that? So what happened to the wise men? Yeah, well, wait a minute. The shepherds are going home already. We haven't heard anything about the wise men. Where are the wise men? Well, as it turns out, the wise men didn't show up right away. They showed up a little bit later, and we're going to be talking about that in the future. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Okay, well, that's it. We have covered the birth of Jesus. But, of course, we're not done with the interesting things that happened at the time of Jesus' birth. We're going to continue next time to talk about what he and Mary and Joseph would have gone through in the early weeks of his birth. And, of course, there's those wise men. we got to talk about the wise men, too. So I hope you'll be joining us when we cover that in the future. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.